We are now turning to Herman Green. So Herman, turn on your mic, share your screen. All right, my mic is on. And I assume you can see my screen now, is that correct? Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to be talking about the noosphere. That is what the dictionary says is the proper pronunciation. I tend to call it the noosphere, but um, whatever you would like. And I describe it as a fear of collective mind and creative synthesis. And I really should have a question mark after that because that's part of the topic that we'll deal with. <laughs> So it's derived from the Greek word nous and speria, spera, or sphere. And there's a lot of literature about who invented the term. Um, some say Teilhard de Chardin, others say Edouard Leroy. And it is agreed that um, Teilhard and Edouard I uh, came up with this term while attending lectures uh, by Bernadsky. And Bernadsky also developed the term once it was uh, once it was enunciated. It has various meanings which we're going to discuss. And in this talk, I'll develop the usages by Chardin and Bernadsky. These are the two main uh, streams and we'll look at various interpretations and end with the meaning for us. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin lived from 1881 until 1955 and his general concept is complexity consciousness. He was a French idealist philosopher and a Jesuit Catholic priest who was trained as a paleontologist and geologist. And most of his career was spent in science studies. He was intensely interested in both nature and spirit and was influenced by Henri Bergson's book, Creative Evolution, which he said provided fuel for a fire that was already consuming my heart and mind. And he synthesized his philosophical and theological understandings in the light of evolution, about which he said, and it is something I agree with, evolution is the general condition to which all other theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow, in which they must satisfy henceforward if they are to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines may follow. While this is a, um, a statement that I think everyone on this, um, in this program will agree with, uh, there actually are, are many different interpretations of uh, evolution and what it means. But the general concept that We've been in a, a state of successive uh, stages, time developmental stages in the history of the universe is one we can all agree on. Evolution, remember he was, um, his career began in the 20s and uh, at this time there was a traditionalist move in the Catholic Church and his thoughts on evolution were not well received. So well not received, that he was banned from publishing any of his work on philosophy and theology. And he was sent to China just to make sure <laughs> that he was away. And China at that time was away. It's not away now, but it was then. He, um, while in China, he was uh, one of the people that was involved in the discovery of the Peking man. 
he observed the evolutionary development of the universe. And just in pictures, we might retrace his journey this way. So uh, now he did not have um, the knowledge of the universe that we have now, but I'm going to go ahead and use our knowledge. Uh, he was looking at the same dynamic without some of the facts that I'll discuss. So the first image is my one I picked out to represent the Big Bang. Well, of course, we have no picture of this, but uh, that's what that represents. So the, how did a sheer burst of energy become this? And the second picture is from the Hubble uh, telescope, and it's uh, one of its images of the deepest parts of space where uh, galaxies, stars were, were being formed. Or how did this, the early Earth bombarded by asteroids, no water, fire, barren land, become this, a watery planet filled with life? Or how did this become this? And this is very ordinary, of course. Uh, I mean, it's ordinary to us. But when you think about it, uh, you plant a seed in the ground in what seems to be inert matter and out of this little seed combining with soil, chemicals, water, become these living beings. Or how did this, the mammals that survived uh, the extinction at the end of the Cenozoic period, become this? Being a student of geology and paleontology, he was aware of that. Now, his timeline was uh, truncated compared to the one that we know of today. But again, it was the same um, apprehension that there'd been a long period of development uh, prior to the human phenomenon. So when we think about it today, on um, the left side is the entire nature uh, timeline. And of course, if we were really to show that uh, part of the top, the vertebrates, as Emlyn said, that would be a sliver smaller than a hair. Um, a vast period of time before the development of vertebrates. And if we were to look at the life timeline in the middle, we would also see a long period of four and a half billion dollars, uh, billion dollars, uh, sorry, uh, billion years of development um, in which we had multicellular life only around um, a billion years ago and um, where we had the life forms that we know in the last 500 million years and where we have the uh, mammals and humans again at the very end. Even in human life on the right, we have a progression from hominoids to homo sapiens to modern humans. He was criticized as being non-scientific his best known work is The Phenomena of the Human. He claimed throughout that book that he was following the evidence. And the evidence shows that over time, connections of matter became increasingly complex and result in greater consciousness. The human was for him a break of a different kind yet it was still following a pattern of emergence in the evolutionary scale. At first there was energy and then there emerged atoms and from that emerged molecules and stars and planets, plants, animals and humans. 
in this sense, early states of matter represent not only what they are, but what they are capable of becoming. This is a very important concept to which I will return. I'm going to repeat it. In this sense, early states of matter represent not only what they are, but what they are capable of becoming. So for Teilhard, becoming futurity is the essence of being. Rather than reality being a sea of particles, he viewed it as threads weaving in and out, responding to forces that encourage complexity, originality, and beauty. Everything is an energy event. It is a capacity for action and for interaction. So it's everything radiates and everything bonds. There are two kinds of energy that he named tangential or the outside of things. This is the kind of cause and effect energy that's the subject of physics and chemistry. Matter in motion, moving other matter in motion. And radial, the inside of things. Tangential energy tends toward more entropy and radial energy tends toward less entropy, greater complexity, and greater consciousness. For Teilhard, consciousness is the result of greater cerebralization. And I mean, in the mammals, mammals had larger brains, so the brain developed. And then this almost a break, you would say, with the human or hominization. So the, the human was a vast increase in consciousness. So the biosphere, actually the geosphere and the biosphere have given rise to the newosphere. I'll repeat Emmeline's slide. I have a slightly different name. Seven spheres, lithosphere, hydrosphere, cryosphere, atmosphere, biosphere. I've got the anthroposphere where he has uh, had the human sphere, I think it was. But there's another one called the pedosphere and that's soil, subject to soil formation processes, which is an interface of lithosphere, hydrosphere, and biosphere for eight. The noosphere. Now, the noosphere, I don't know how you picture it. Um, we'll talk later about how people have imagined it. But it is a um, band of consciousness that uh, surrounds the earth, envelops the earth, or maybe permeates the earth. Now, some have tried to locate it. A man named Oliver Reeser wrote in the 70s that it was located in the Van Allen belts. Where it's located is, your guess, is as good as mine. But what is it, according to Chardin? In his view, evolutionary movement has a direction. It is drawn in a direction. Now, for this, he's criticized as being uh, Lamarckian. But you go back to those earlier, the earlier slide that I had, and you see this development over billions of years of increasing complexity. And at the very end, this increasing consciousness, it's hard to argue that there's not some kind of arrow in that. The whole of the universe has been guided by a psychic process. So for him, energy has a psychic dimension. And in the unfolding of this, the potentiating of this energy, the psychic energy, 
we've now arrived at the Psychozoic era. We've moved on Earth from geogenesis to biogenesis to neogenesis. Just as the emergence of human consciousness has led to a twofold widening of connection and centering. So let's think about that for a moment. Our consciousness, what we're able to take in as humans is wider so far as we know than any other species or being. And yet it's all centered in our person and our subjectivity. So in fact, in our own development, we experience as our widening takes place, that also our centering grows greater. So the neosphere is an emergent order of being leading to synthesis and ultimate convergence drawn to, not impelled by, but drawn to an omega point at the end of the world. Now, I'm using his language. I'm not at this point endorsing it or not endorsing it. I'm simply giving his language. So again, by analogy to human development, this widening and the connecting that's increasingly taking place, this radial energy of connection, is also an energy of centering or kind of a, well, I think even uses the term personalization of the universe, ultimately to a, a convergence in a mega point. Now, a different idea of the neosphere is developed by Vladimir Ivanovich Bernadsky. Now, remember, these people did know each other and were influenced by each other. Bernadsky's idea was biosphere to neosphere. Sounds similar. Uh, but he also focuses on a concept of biogeochemical combustion, which I'll come back to. He was a Russian mineralogist and geochemist known for his most famous book, The Biosphere. Now, Irina Trubetskova wrote a wonderful PhD dissertation that's online about Bernadsky. And she really credits him with um, a huge, well, he did have a huge impact. He, he, he moved ecology to something like what people understand it today. He kind of originated biogeochemical analysis or earth systems science. He was a giant. <laughs> his, his idea that biosphere was not just living beings because the living beings don't exist by themselves. We take in air, we take in minerals. It's a whole set of systems. The biosphere is a definite geological envelope marked markedly distinguished from all other geological envelopes of our planet prior to the time of the, um, well, exactly the others that exist below the biosphere and those that exist before the biosphere. This is only, only because it is inhabited by living matter, which reveals itself as a geological force of immense proportions completely remaking the biosphere and changing its physical, chemical, and mechanical properties. So go back in your imagination to that uh, picture I showed you of the early Earth and the one I showed you of Earth and then plants and animals. In his definition, the biosphere is the, uh, the single greatest geological force on the earth, moving, processing, and recycling several billion tons of mass a year. So the earth was completely reshaped by life. We are now, however, in a biosphere, neosphere transition. Humans have become the dominant geological force, 
signaled and furthered by biogeochemical combustion. So this is taking the elements of the earth and burning them. So by doing that, the humans have formed novel plastics, metals, all kinds of uh, novel compounds in nature. And of course, uh, through fossil fuels, they have uh, created the energy that has allowed um, the progress of civilization, progress of civilization leading to a crisis. He wrote, in our century, the biosphere has acquired an entirely new meaning. It is being revealed as a planetary phenomenon of cosmic character. In the 20th century, humans, for the first time in the history of Earth, knew and embraced, knew, knew and embraced the whole biosphere, completed the geographic map of the planet Earth and colonized the whole surface. Humankind became a single totality in, uh, in the life on Earth. The newosphere is the last of many stages in the evolution of the biosphere in geological history. As Earth had had other spheres, it now had a sphere really more like an evolutionary dynamic of mind. A sphere of mind. Bernaski wrote, the whole of humankind put together represents an insignificant mass of the planet's matter. Its strength is derived not from its matter, but from its brain. If man understood this and does not use his brain, if man understands this, and does not use his brain and his work for self-destruction, an immense future is open before him in the geological history of the biosphere. Bernadske saw the newosphere as being of cosmic significance, but it was just as the biosphere and the earth was. He wrote that, to his knowledge, he didn't qualify it really, he said that the Earth was a singular reality in the entire universe. Now we have astrobiology, which is uh, uh, exploring, as people have in their minds explored uh, this for centuries, of life in the universe outside of Earth. But in any case, <clears throat> we know that within the universe that is known to us, that life on Earth is of cosmic significance. I mean, it is a giant significance to, to the universe that this happened. And um, he has uh, sometimes talked about cosmism. You'll read about cosmism and, and Bernatsky, and you'll see a lot of kind of wild theories of cosmism. But for him, it was a, it was a much more simple concept. To understand something scientifically means to place an event in the framework of all known scientific reality. That is to know something, is to place it in the cosmos, in the universe, because it's all connected. It's all time developmental. Bernaski was both ecocentric and cosmocentric. He also foresaw a cosmic future for humans, that is for human minds, but he was not a cosmic mystic as was Chardin. He was a cosmic realist. Oh, I repeated that quote, I'll have to edit that out. Mm. So on the bottom bullet. So what was the noosphere for Bernadsky? 
it's actually, I think, a fairly simple thing. Use your brains, increase your collective intelligence with an understanding of the biosphere and the cosmos. In other words, the, the noosphere was our collective intelligence. And we're in a neogenic crisis because we haven't yet developed our consciousness and brains to control the powers that we possess and make it mutually beneficial or enhancing. Now, let's talk about the popular usage of the term noosphere. It's popular usage, usage is like a Rorschach test. People get all kinds of things out of the concept or term noosphere. For some, it's a global brain operating independently of our own brains. For others, it's the internet. You'll find articles on this. The pattern in the background is um, a picture tracing internet connections in a certain geographic era, area. So it looks like, looks like our brains, right? For others, it's a cosmic human a leap in consciousness ultimately pervading the universe. I'll leave it to your imagination what that means. For others, it is Ray Kurzweil's singularity when computers overtake the abilities of human brains and become post-human beings. So for those of you who are familiar with Kurzweil's work, he says we will, in terms of being a good ancestor, we will count as our greatest accomplishment, giving rise to intelligent robots that have all the emotions and capabilities that we do, but with much, much, much greater intelligence. And that intelligence ultimately will pervade the universe as um, information. And interestingly, I don't know what his position is today, but Kurzweil's position when he wrote that book was that it was only on Earth that there was human life and it was our destiny to fill the universe with this information. For others, it's simply the Anthropocene. The noosphere is just humans impacting the earth through their intelligence. So what I'm saying is that uh, in popular usage, the noosphere has many meanings and um, has released a lot of different kinds of imagination. So what are we to make of the noosphere? Is it a convergent global cosmic mind that is becoming its own reality? In other words, does it um, uh, is there a brain that surrounds, I mean, is there um, a cloud of, um, of information and experience that is encompassing the earth that is becoming its own brain independent um, of the brains of the individual humans? Is it simply the buildup of collection of collective and easily available information? 
And by this, I don't mean a collection in a cloud, I mean a collection in different places. So when we talk about cloud computing, we're not talking, well, I mean, this, of course, you know, it's not really a joke. Um, we're not talking about computers in the clouds. We're talking about computers located in different places that store information. So is the noosphere simply the buildup and the availability of information that allows humans to have greater consciousness, awareness, and even, as Emlyn mentioned, empathy as a result of this greater awareness. Is it not so much a band around the earth or is it as much as it is a transformation of our human consciousness resulting from our increased awareness, contigu contiguity and intensity of experience? So you go back to that image of the man with his mind that was expanding into the universe. So do we, um, in a kind of psychic process, expand our minds to encompass uh, not just realities around us, but psychically encompass um, other people, nature, the earth, the solar system, universe. I mean, you could also say here, does our minds extend into the universe? Now, I'm not saying it's one of these or the other. I'm saying, so what do we make of the noosphere? Or is it simply the Anthropocene? the reality that thinking beings are having an increased impact on Earth. So you have the geosphere, where it was geological forces that were shaping the Earth. You have the uh, biosphere, where it was biological forces other than humans that were shaping the Earth. And then in this late phase, this great acceleration, it's the humans, it's the human brain <laughs> that's shaping the Earth. So let me go back over those real quickly. <clears throat> is it a convergent global cosmic mind that's becoming its own reality? Or is it like a library, simply a collection of information that's easily available through mechanical means, through material means? Is it a transformation of human consciousness resulting from our increased awareness, contiguity, and intensity of experience? Or is it simply the fact that humans are having a huge impact because of our brains? I know you'd like the answer to this. Reconciling Chardin and Vernadsky. Now, I may not have universal agreement on what I'm say, about to say, but I'm saying when you look at those three time scales that I gave you of nature, of life, and of, of humans, it's hard to argue that there wasn't some kind of movement in that, in a direction towards greater complexity and greater consciousness. And yet, scientific materialism argues exactly against that. We live in an accidental universe. It's hard to argue on, as Vernadsky thought, that human minds aren't shaping Earth and that we are in a crisis of consciousness and thinking. And we need to use our brains better with ecocentric and cosmocentric awareness. I, I can talk through how I would reconcile those two, but I'll, I'll leave that for later. I mean, perhaps for the question and answer. My own view, and what's yours? That will be our conversation. My own view. In some way, our thoughts and experiences 
are retained in the cosmos. Um, greater in the Earth sphere and are made available other than by material means. In other words, you don't have to be hooked up or have a, a wave as it's physically understood. But maybe a, maybe psi is a wave, I don't know. But maybe it's not psi. Maybe it just is. Maybe it's maybe it's the other side of the physical that's always there, the radial part that's always there with the physical. Now for Chardin, he can rightly, in my view, be accused of anthropocentrism. He really saw the human as unique. And the consciousness, the noosphere, was human consciousness. Perhaps that would have changed as he learned with us of the sentience of animals. Although this has been known by indigenous people forever. So I think the noosphere actually involves not only our own experiences and thoughts. Now, let's talk about thoughts and experiences for a moment. If you've ever raised a child, you can, you can teach them your thoughts, but you can't teach them your experience. Try as you might. You tell them stories, but you can't teach them their experience. So what I'm saying is the experiences, as well as these are not just ideas in the noosphere, in my view. It's also the experiences of value, meaning, richness, beauty. This information experience is somehow synthesized and creatively presented to us with relevance for us and for future generations. The potential of the present is realized in the future so, if we took a picture of the universe when it was just atoms in chaos, and that's what we described, and that's what the universe was, that wouldn't be an accurate description because those atoms were bound to be bonded, and I don't exactly mean uh, predestined, but they had that potential for bonding at the very beginning. And we couldn't understand the atom for what it is without the molecule, because the atom as an individual atom isn't fully expressed until it's bonded. And the living cell, the, the, the atom, the, the, the molecule wouldn't be understood without understanding the living cell. I mean, the capacity for what appears to be inert matter to become a self-sustaining uh, system in a cell. And if we just stop with the unicellular animals a billion years ago, we wouldn't have understood the potential of the cell. So the potential of the present is realized in the future. And in my view, the noosphere does not operate autonomously. It's not some global brain out there detached from our ongoing experience. We are generating the noosphere. And the noosphere is being given back to us as a kind of greater experience. Now, how this takes place and to what degree and so forth, I, I'll be glad to give you my speculations, but uh, it's just to say that there is some kind of, of um, coming back. So when we talk about being a good ancestor, you know, what we generate in this understanding will stay around forever. Um, our thoughts, 
our experiences. Now, for those of you who are frustrated writers, who've written your books and only 500 people have read them, you can feel redeemed by the newosphere. I certainly feel redeemed by the newosphere because that's about how many read my things at best. Um, but I like to think, I do think, that even where my thoughts are not read, they have meaning that they add to the universe. So we're generators of this. Now, just briefly, we have these stories like the hundredth monkey, where thoughts or patterns are developed and then they appear in entire species. Of course, these are contested heavily. But we also have uh, things that seem to happen more or less simultaneously. One person invents the telephone in one part of the world, and another person invents it in another. Or language arises in one part of the world, and language ar arises in another. So there is this kind of simultaneity of consciousness. So the newosphere does not operate autonomously, but rather in conjunction with, without the existing beings experiencing this, the newosphere wouldn't be having much of a life, in my view. It's not independent. Herman, it's not are you there? Out there, yes. Hate to bother you, uh, but it's actually uh, nine twenty or uh, ten twenty. Okay, I'm sorry. Us, you know, I was but, running. Yeah, I was running on the basis of ten of of, of ten thirty, and um, I can easily end this right now. Uh, I was hoping to preserve ten minutes for questioning. I simply had my time calculation wrong, and I was actually dragging it out so I'd have ten minutes left for questioning. But let me simply end with this: What does this have to do with big history and hope? Big history is necessary for the expansion of our consciousness and the ability to act relevantly. The universe has an inside story as well as an outside material story that cannot be separated and are one. Meaning, value, and life are part of the universe story. Paradoxically, the existence of the new sphere will not save us. It is not autonomous. And yet, in it lies our hope. Collective responsibility, knowledge, experience, dreams, potential expansion, futurity, and through neogenesis, the Anthropocene epoch may lead to the Ecozoic era. Thank you, Herman. And um, there's been a lot of lovely chatter on the chat. I recommend that people open that and read about it. And, uh, you know, people were absolutely underscoring and um, jumping to your finale there. So there's a, this is just, you know, you, you are um, a uh, synergizer of mm -hmm. big history. 